So welcome to my CEH version 9 material. This is chapter 8, malware. What gets really funny is malware is an umbrella term for pretty much anything malicious. Uh, when you think adware, when you think um, spyware, when you think ransomware or hostageware or any type of code that's going to be malicious, normally we classify it as malware. Malware is synonymous uh, with the leading plague of modern technology. Pretty much if you have a phone, if you have a tablet, if you have anything that connects to a network, there is a good likelihood that it probably has some form of malware on it. Now, the malware could be as simple as a toolbar that you don't want. Uh, it could be cookies that track what you're doing. It could be a ticking time bomb or remote access trojan just waiting. So there's lots of different things that it could be. There's been some real good estimates on how much malware is created. And typically the common accepted amount is between 1,000 and 1,500 new pieces of malware every hour. Our book says 1,200, but I've, said, I've seen sources between both. Uh, it's more than just malicious code. It's evolving to readily steal information or to steal data. Forms of malware can include things such as viruses, worms, Trojan horses, or any type of Trojan, uh, remote access Trojan, remote access uh, items, anything that's grouped under the Trojan name, rootkit, spyware, adware, ransomware. What gets really funny is all of these are also umbrella terms for their respective areas. Uh, you have to look at the intent, and that will help describe what item something may uh, fall into which category. For example, pop-ups that don't really collect any information, while it still is malware, that could be types of adware. But what type of pop-ups are we talking about? Pop-ups when you view a specific website, pop-ups that will actually scan a web uh, page and then embed uh, hyperlinks in code so when you mouse over them, they give you a pop-up. I mean, all of them are different types of adware. Same thing can be done for ransomware, spyware, rootkits. Rootkits are always a big one because normally May-ish, you always end up with brand new rootkits that normally infect Internet Explorer or poses antiviruses or even infect antiviruses. That way you end up with a legitimate program that, again, is legitimate, but the core software is infected. Internet Explorer is very common for this, where IE or iExplorer actually is uh, modified and then becomes the virus. That's just one example. Plenty of rootkit killers out there to help uh, mitigate the risk to Internet Explorer. But again, lots of programs out there that will legitimately pose as a legitimate program. Authors of malware. So this is always a good thing. Who creates malware? Everyone always says, oh, it's criminals. Is it? I think a lot of it's honestly students. Uh, maybe not a traditional like high school student or traditional college student, but it's people that want to learn. Sometimes they're skilled programmers. Sometimes they're not so skilled programmers. Sometimes they're just casual people trying to figure out a better way to, to do things. Yes, criminals are also part of this, but a lot of people that help develop this just want to see if they can do it. They want to challenge. Not always criminals. So let's look at a closer look. Students could be newbies. There could just be people that are new to, to coding or new to the computer languages that want to see what they can do. Young computer users. Uh, more and more uh, ransomware is being created and generated by 12, 13, 14 year olds. And then their deployment of that ransomware is holding hospitals, holding large corporations hostage. So younger computer users, definitely. Professionals and researchers also use and also create malware. 
They same thing with any type of like a biological virus. They create malicious items so they could study and better protect. So let's go and look at like the virus family tree. We have an MBR type virus that infects the master boot record. We have file form viruses. We have viruses that infect macros. Uh, common macros could be like office programs. Uh, service injection viruses. These are viruses that actually inject themselves into services. Multi-party, that's pretty straightforward. Polymorphic, so that's a good one. What is polymorphic viruses? This is adaptive. There are generally two categories. Malware that has the, uh, the ability to change their code and propagate, and malware that doesn't. Polymorphic does have the ability to change. And then encrypted. I'm not really sure what they meant by encrypted, but viruses can also use encryption just like any computer could. So let's go on to what's a worm. So a worm is self-propagating, doesn't uh, need any type of user input, does require a system to be vulnerable to the uh, specific code that it's doing, it replicates and spreads, and it spreads very rapidly. So that's always a good thing. Well, it can be a good thing. Depends on the intent. Warm example could be Slammer. It doubles every uh, eight, and, uh, eight and a half seconds for the first three minutes of its life. It ran uh, at its peak 55 million scans. It infected tens of thousands within minutes. It's a small uh, size. Basically, it generated random IP addresses and preyed on SQL server systems. So there is more than just that, but if you Google worms or computer viruses slash worms, you will get plenty of examples. So what's spyware? So normally this type of software operates in the background and it quietly collects information. It could be looking at things like your browsing habits, your website's uh, access activities, uh, maybe what emails you're reading. I don't think that torrent sites are a spyware, but I think uh, what they were meaning was spyware could be built into some torrents. Uh, so when you download them, it also downloads spyware, but that's going to be really dependent on where you're getting the torrents. Not all torrents are illegal. Not all torrent sites are illegal. So do keep that in mind. Trojan horses. Uh, this is that looks like a legitimate program. And then it can be host to other things. It's a carrier. Uh, normally it relies on social engineering, but that's really subjective. Could be a, an attachment, could be on a flash drive. It could be lots of things. Could be a rubber ducky, a physical rubber ducky that acts as a legitimate flash drive, but actually also then has a payload in it. So when you actually plug in a computer, it then infects the, uh, the victim. So what do Trojans do? Basically, they allow for remote access. They want to be able to gain access to your system so that they can do tasks. That tasks could be creating a backdoor, spying on you, maybe stealing passwords, maybe installing a keylogger to steal your passwords, maybe to send messages on the attacker's behalf. Could just be that they just sit and wait and when need be or when called upon, use your computer or your computer resources to help attack something. So there's lots of different things where Trojans can be used. Basically, it sits there typically unnoticed until a specific task or criteria is met, then it does something. So we talked about some backdoors, we talked about a little bit of Trojans, we kind of categorized malware. Again, this is not in-depth at all. This is more of a just a, this is what malware is, just a nice clean overview. I don't think we talked about the importance of keyloggers, but keyloggers are out there, small programs, and they can just record everything that you're typing. So 
do be kind of diligent. Regular scans are important. Regular updates are important. And I look forward to talking to you on our next chapter. Thank